Hey, welcome in everybody to the Sports Fanatic News Sixer Show as we're going to talk about our 17 and 7. Yes, you heard that correctly. 17 and 7. Philadelphia 76ers, 10 games above 500, first in the East right now. I am Joe Bora, joined by the great Andrew Santangelo, who finally found some time for us today amongst his very busy, legendary schedule. How you doing, Ann? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Yeah, it's been a very odd week down here. Um, got a lot of a lot of cold weather, a lot of ice. Uh, more a lot of ice, never, not really snow, so it's uh, giving me off the last couple of days, and it feels good. Yeah, it's always nice to have some free time, which is time to do uh, different podcasting right. and things you love to do. <laughs> yeah, um, always nice to do that, but um, before we go in, I'll start this with how I usually just start my hockey videos of people. From the, the way this team has performed in the first couple of weeks of the season, what's your first couple impressions you take away from the start to the season thus far? My first impression, I think, uh, first and foremost, is I think we got to give credit where credit's due. I mean, we, we ripped on Embiid here and there for the kind of shape he's been in toward the end of seasons and what we wanted to see him doing the off season. I think no one can argue with how well he's turned his season, or not season, his career around this year it has taken that next step into becoming a better player, better fit, uh, fitness-wise, and just better overall. And he's having a career year. I mean, he's without question uh, in the MVP race and the running. Um, some people are viewing right now as the front runner. Some people view him just uh, on the outside looking in for that front runner spot. But without question, he's he's the reason why his team's 17 and seven. I mean, you look at the numbers when he's not playing and you just see the difference in this team. So I think that goes to show how special he is to this team. And I think he's really put a stamp on this season. And Honestly, he's the reason, main reason why we are 17 and seven, and in first place in the Eastern Conference. Uh, and I think it's the, I guess, it's the third best uh, record overall in the entire NBA behind the Jazz and Lakers. Uh, with the Jazz obviously being the most surprising there. Yeah. But my second impression, I think, is something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna point to one guy specific, or I guess two guys specifically, but the overall bench depth. I think that's something I know you and I on here before have talked about. I know that's what a lot of fans have talked about. But there's two guys in particular that I do want to mention. And first is Dwight Howard, his ability to come off the bench. And uh, whether he's scoring or not, he's always going to get rebounds. He's always people putting that, that next uh, effort out there. And I think uh, that, that's gone, gone the show here. And listen, a lot of people ripped on him for the way he his attitude and everything was uh, towards players. But whether it's the Lakers or whatnot, the second t- second go around or but whatever it happened he, he's a fantastic locker room guy it seems like now and i think you've seen that and heard it as Joel Embiid said he's one of the best teammates he's ever played with so i think that goes to show and i think his veteran presence and this is something we we were hoping Al Horford would have had last year and we thought he could come in and yep. do for Embiid and that didn't work out as well as everyone hoped obviously and i think it really is working out now with Dwight Howard and you're seeing that uh, in that sense. And then, so Howard Spark off the bench for veteran leadership and his play overall. And then number two, Shake Milton. He's really made a name for himself. He's a guy I've always been high on since day one we drafted. I thought it was a, a very good sleeper pick there. And listen, he, he made, I know he got off to a little slow start last year and then toward the end of the year really made a name for himself, but he did nothing but work off in the work hard in the off season. And he's carried that over into this season. And uh, he, I mean, hey, he's only averaging 14 points off the bench, which is just an incredible number. Yeah, he's uh, doing good. Uh, Shake uh, definitely is uh, deserving the people that call him shake and bake. Um, so he's deserving of that one a little bit more now. Um, but I think, uh, what you said about Dwight too, I feel like some of the old critics of him, some people just like to be a critic of certain players and Dwight Howard seemed to be one of those players that I think a lot of people went, uh, he's had this about him in the past. Let's just keep rolling with that until proven otherwise. And then like you said, in LA, they were proven otherwise because of how much LeBron complimented him. Others complimented him. Now you got Joel complimenting him here. Um, it, 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 you can't put that in the media anymore because you're going to look like Gomer Pyle like a like like Marcus Hayes would say uh and look like an absolute idiot. So the that's why you can't do that. Um but that's um a big thing for me too. I think having Dwight Howard having that leadership but also just having that tenacity. Dwight Howard's old school basketball. That's the best way to put him. Like he's he really shouldn't be playing anymore in this year, but he's figured out how to do it and still play well because he pounds you, he gets called for fouls all the time cuz he plays like he's still playing 15 years ago. 
Like, that's why he gets called for all these fouls. And everyone's like, that is B. Like, that is not a f-. Where in, the, in this era it actually is, but it's annoying because you saw Dwight earlier in his career getting away with it all the time when he was a star because it was okay then, where now everything's a lot more ticky-tacky. So yes. it, it's um it, it's fun watching him because he brings the old school to the new school, and it's kind of a fun uh, – mix of things when you watch Dwight Howard play um, basketball in today's day and age um, and figure, and he still figures it out. Um, and I, obviously it's a better pickup than having young guys. You had a lot of young random backup centers filling in in the last couple of years or guys that we just didn't play for whatever reason. We picked them up like O'Quinn who actually looked good when he was with the Knicks and then we just didn't use him here. So like there now we actually have a guy that we're using and he's being productive and that's really good to see. Your other point with Shake, yeah, Shake's having a very good season, very good uh, three-point percentage, along with Ferk, who's been a very good, uh, more consistent surprise this year. Um, I wouldn't say he shoots fine. It's just consistency's been the bigger surprise this year. And then you have the rumors of J.J. Redick, which we'll get into um, in a little bit. Um, but Joe Owen Bede is definitely doing really well this year. I mean, he's almost averaging 30 points. Guy's averaging 29 and 3, 10 and 7. I have the um, notes on my phone. 20 or 27. If you average 27 assists, that would be ridiculous. <laughs> 2.7. Oh, <yeah. laughs> 2.7 assists um, and 1.2 blocks and 1.3 steals. I didn't realize he averaged that. Oh, um, mm. Almost one and a half steals. Um, so he's doing really good in all facets. And you're absolutely right. We were only able to somehow, I don't even know how we figured that out in that Indiana game. That was literally like Miss Anelli said. We somehow figured out how to win without Joel B because it was like Duke was playing Colgate. And Colgate went up a lot early. And then they went, okay, we're going to go to a zone. And then Colgate's just like, dude, what's a zone? A zone? What is a zone? You know what a zone is? You ever see a zone in your life? You? No? Okay, cool. Like, that's literally what that game looked like. They were talking about it on Miss Anelli. The Sixers barely practiced a zone all season. Doc's like, let's roll with the zone and try to see what happens. And apparently the former Pacers coach that worked for them, that's on our staff, is the one that told him to do that. And all of a sudden the Pacers forgot how to play basketball. <laughs> it's like once we went to a zone, they're just like, what the hell is a zone? I've never seen this before in my life. And you're just like, you're NBA play, <laughs> like, 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 that was great that we were able to come back. But that game was so, like, I agree with Mike. The Pacers ain't contenders. They're not. You ain't going anywhere. Because if that happens, you need, <laughs> you're need you not going anywhere. If you're an NBA team and a team just implements a zone and that throws you off that much, you're not going. Like, like that just goes to show you're not contenders. Like, the, you know, that, there's no excuse for that. But it was a great job by Doc and a great job by the Sixers, but it was in a reverse effect such an awful job by the Pacers to not be able to figure out a zone, which is one of the most simple things you learn as a kid growing up playing basketball, how to beat a zone. I learned about that when I was like eight. <laughs> so like, how do NBA players not know how to beat a zone? Like, like that, that didn't, that didn't make any sense, but I'm happy they didn't because we took advantage of it and pounding them down at the end of that game. But since I brought up, what were your thoughts on like just how stupid that was that the Pacers couldn't figure out a zone? <laughs> The reason why it gives them trouble is because you mix in you, after being so set on a defense, you throw something in at the end of the game and it works. It throws an offense off. You're so used to facing that man to man. And if you remember last year, the same thing happened to the Sixers. I mean, when you recognize these teams that don't have shooters like uh, um, Danny Green, Seth Curry, like we have this year, when you were going back to last year's and you had a struggling Josh Richardson, a struggling Al Horford, I mean, the Pacers are kind of the same way. They don't have that pure lockdown three point shooter really. That's and, a good point. and that's what goes on there because when, when you switch to that zone, you kind of take out the drive effect and you're forcing them to, to force those shots up. And when you're not consistent like that, it, it works. And credit to Doc Rivers for making that move, um, move there to do that. And I, I think that goes to show the coaching adjustments he can do uh, at the end games. And that goes a long way. And I think you've seen a difference in that this year as well. So I, I think, I, I just think. Especially, I think it was the Heat that did the Sixers when they beat us two or three times. I think and it that, was, yeah. That's what's crazy is, you're right. I mean, I mean, you think an NBA team you'd be able to, but when you're so set on facing the same defense and you're practicing to face that defense, you're watching the tape, and the Sixers all of a sudden 
randomly just throw a zone at you. And it's not just a traditional two, three. I think then they run all different types of sets and they stretch it out and everything. They have Ben and Thibel usually up top as the two quarterbacks of up top. Yeah. And then that's how they do it. The defense we're used to is you, me and you, we could, we would have our center chill in the paint. You can't do that in the NBA because no. of the defense of three seconds. So it's not really the, the same situation there. I, I just think with that stretched out and, and it forced the teams out of their, I think the biggest thing is it forced them out of their comfort zone because it adds a lot more pressure there at the top. Sometimes you double team, especially when you have Simmons and Thibel double, double teaming you two of the best defenders. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's what just causes a big mix. So I, yeah, I, I, I think something they can turn to in other games as well. I think it worked that well. Yeah, I agree. I think it worked like you were kind of hitting that because of the personnel we have. You have Simmons and Thibel you can use up top. and Embiid's a great slide. He's going to come in and block you. Dwight's the same way. You can pay more on the block or come into the center and block you. Um, so I think I agree with that. That's a, the personnel uh, helps. Another guy, though, that I think did well, the one start we put him in, or two star, no, one star we put him in. I got that right the first time. Was uh, Bradley when we put Dwight on the bench because Doc said how much Dwight did good on the bench. It seems like when Do- Joel's out, that might be able to be the strategy because he did fine. And I think it was about 16 or change minutes. And then we put in Howard off the bench, who I think ended up playing more minutes than Bradley as a total. But both did good in that game where. If that's the strategy you use, that's the reason why I like bringing Tony Bradley. It's not because he was anything special when I said that in the offseason. It's because he brings the experience of having a couple more years under his belt than a Norval Pell who's really just a G League player. That That's more what I was getting at at this point. Like You have a guy that's been around the block a little bit more than someone that has no experience at all pretty much, other than being thrown into stupid situations by Brett Brown. So like that's more that's more what I was – getting at with that with that one but we have um this year i think something we also have to get into is um the whisperer of doc wiver doc doc wivers doc rivers <laughs> with um with tobias harris um tobias harris was good last year very good last year at time but he's clearly when you look at his career numbers the best of the best in terms of himself With Doc Rivers, it was like that in L.A. It's like that now with 20.2, 7.4, 3 assists, 0.9 steals, and 0.9 blocks. What do you think contributes to it's just chemistry, or do you think more goes into it? Like, what do you think from the outside looking in contributes to Doc being the Tobias Whisperer? I think it's a mix. I think does Doc have an effect on him? Yes, I think he does have an effect on the degree. But I I think bigger than the Doc reunion with him, I think it goes – to what the Sixers and Dale Morey did with the roster. If you're if you if you look at last year, to me Harris isn't really a different player this year. To me this year you're seeing a Tobias Harris that can go back into his role. We talk about with the Phillies, Hect, having Hector Harris outstretched into a closer when we want to see him be the setup guy because that's clearly where he's better at. We talk about the Eagles when you have before we got Darius Slay, when you had corners playing the one-two spot, when they really should have been like a two-three corner, uh, and we we talk about how if you get the right guys, it, it puts them in a better position. I think that's what you're getting right here with Harris. Last year, you had a struggling Josh Richardson, as I mentioned. You had a struggling Horford, as I mentioned. You had Simmons, who doesn't shoot the three. So really, who was your three-point shooter last year? Tobias Harris. Has yeah. he ever really been a three-point shooter? No, he's been a a shot selective three point shooter that that will hit him time to time. And that is what he's able to do this year. That's what Maury did by coming in here, getting a Seth Curry, getting a Danny Green, having Shake Milton produce off the bench. Now having Furcon be more consistent, like you mentioned. That lets Harris be his one to two, three shots a game. And and I think that's the biggest thing is he's he's now being able to be that Harris that likes to drive, take those elbow shots, take the good shot selective shots. And that's what you're getting at Tobias Harris now. And I think that really has been the biggest adjustment for him uh, more than anything is you got pieces around him that fit better. No, that makes sense. And uh, what you just said in part of that too is uh, you put him in the right position. And now that you have him shooting those selective threes, he has one of his best career three-point percentages at 44%. So now that you have him back to shooting the right selectiveness he's in, he's hitting the threes, he's more confident shooting them because he doesn't have to overshoot them. Yeah, that definitely makes – sense to me as well um i think another guy though that i've been very impressed with you brought up before we get to uh since this will all tie in uh trading for another shooter and jj uh seth curry's almost shooting 50 percent from three 
the guy shooting 40.493 <laughs> from three. Like, like, like that, that you pretty much have a 50 50 shot. Like, that, like that's a guy you don't want shooting. He's shooting better than his brother right now, actually, from <laughs> three. Uh, so that just goes to show how hot Seth has started the season. He's been so hot that when I was on a live the other night while watching the Sixers, I called him Steph Curry by accident when he made a shot. And then I'm like, oh, no, wait, I meant Seth Curry. I wish we had both of them on our team. Um, but, like, no, he's doing so well that it, that it's even more surprising than you expected. Like, I expect him to shoot, like, the 44 to 46, 47. But 50% almost, like... That's just ridiculous. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Steph or Seth Curry? I did it again. Seth Curry, <laughs> this for. Maybe that's the guy we'll trade for, Steph. Yeah, uh, yeah. Trade, get, get Ben Simmons out of here. I don't care how much older Steph Curry is. Just trading for, just trading for Steph Curry. Hey, you bring in Steph Curry, then you just trade for Austin Rivers, and you can get the whole family here. Exactly, yeah. yeah, there, <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, on a serious note, I, I think, first off, Seth Curry has been unbelievable. I, I feel bad that he had to go through the whole virus situation and, and come back like that. Because before that, like, it's clear that that affected him. It has affected him pretty good, and it still yes. does. One, his conditioning is clearly different. And two, and, and two, I mean, you look at his numbers. I mean, don't get me wrong. Obviously, 49% is an unbelievable number and is fantastic. But I think before he had a missed time, I think he was at like 57 58%. He was so, a- 50, yeah. I think, I mean, that's an incredible number. And since he's been back, I think it's it's like 30%, and that's why it's dropped. But no, I think, again, this is what spacing the floor does. This is what you, this is what I, this is what I've, every fan was calling for uh, the last couple of years when, when we had guys like J.J. Redick, Marco Bellinelli. That's why we wanted to run it back, because we had shooters, and then you lose them and built that team last year. And it's clear when you have guys like Simmons and Embiid, I mean, it, you just can't have non-shooters, and that's that's what they did. So Seth Curry's come in and made a huge, huge impact um, here for this team, and I think it's going to go a long way as the uh, season continues. Once he gets his feet back under his belt, starts getting back in that game shape and everything, and you'll start seeing him even go back to that improvement. Yeah, I, he's going to continue I, to get open look after open look. And I've honestly, I mean, don't get me wrong, he's not a lockdown defender, but I've also been a little impressed with his defense. I, was, I wasn't I was expecting it to, to be where it is at as well. Yeah, he competes really well on defense. I think bringing in a guy like Danny Green, who's a defender first and foremost at this point of his career, that kind of is a D and three guy at this point, more than a three and D guy, honestly, only shooting in the mid 30% at this point of his career. Um you, which is really league average. So, uh, but that helps you with the defensive end to be able to uh, to teeter in the defensive end. Lately, though, in a couple games, he shot forty four percent against the Lakers, which is obviously a good team to actually shoot well from three against. Uh, Fifty Detroit's not a great team to shoot well from three against, but fifty percent, fifty seven against Charlotte, and then. Um, the last good game you have for Boston, he also shot there. It is that's what it was. Boston, he shot fifty percent against too. So Green seems to be stepping up against the bigger teams when you actually need him more. Like Boston and L.A., like I just mentioned, he shot the better three point percentages of the season he has against. As long as he keeps doing that and Ding up and being the D, the defense and three guy, I'm fine with that because you got Shake that's developing now to be a shooter. If Ferk can stay more consistent, I think he averages about. 13. Uh, I have to look at that. What, is, 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 what, what, what average did you need? Ferk. He averages 8.4 points a game. 8.4. Then what, what did I get? Has he been like 13 in a couple past games? But honestly, if <laughs> Ferk comes, if Ferk comes, yes, yes, that's what it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He averaged 13 in the in the last two games. That's why I got 13 from that. He had 13 and 13 Portland, Brooklyn. I'm my bad. Yeah. That's if Furkan's right. contributing eight points off the bench every night, though, I mean that that's gonna go a long way for this team. Uh, yeah, I mean that's right. what that's what you need for him. You don't. Need, I mean, obviously, don't get me wrong. I'll I'll take thirteen all day, but you yeah. don't need thirteen if you're getting your fifteen, your fourteen and a half to fifteen from Shake Milton to being that six man uh, candidate off off the bench. If you're getting the numbers from Dwight Howard, and you're still getting those other numbers, like you don't need Furkan to be. I mean, again, I'll take it, but. You only need that seven, eight point mark from him, and, and that's going to go a long way uh, for this team. I know he struggled. Uh, he struggled in the Portland game. Um, I know he finished with thirteen points, but he struggled in that game. I think he, he was one for seven from three, and that's he kind of played an extended role as a starter in that in that game. 
I think because of the success he had in the previous two games, I forget who was out that day. I think they might rest a Curry. I think uh, it was Curry. Yeah. So they started Furcon, and I think that's again. You talk about playing a role. He's clearly not a starter. I mean, you know, yeah. I like Furcon, but he's not a starter, and that's when he seems to struggle when you put him in that role. But outside of that one for seven game, I mean, three for six against Brooklyn, three for five against Indiana, and then two for four against Minnesota. So th- those numbers are what you need from him. Exactly. I completely agree. Um, and now we're moving to, like I said, that was a segue to get back to our uh, lo- belovable man here in Philadelphia that everybody wants back. Well, not everybody. Uh, 80% of people probably want back. Um, what do you feel about the rumors of J.J. Redick? And him coming back, I understand his three-point percentage is down this year, but that could have to do with the team he's on as well. So what are your thoughts about that, and what are your thoughts about bringing him back? So this is – I've been countering this for a while now since the rumor started a few weeks ago. And you look at it where do we need – we need points – we need a little more off the bench. I will agree with that. You need shooters. The only thing I want to be careful with in in a trade for J.J. is, one, how much you give up. I don't know what their asking price is going to be for him. Um, his contracts, he's getting a lot of money this year, so we'll see if, if you eat that. Maybe you have to give up less. Uh, so that's my big concern is I, I wouldn't pay a whole lot for him, but if you can find a cheap deal for him, I'd gladly take him back. Again, you need points off the bench. You have defenders and Matisse off the bench and Dwight Howard, who I think was a, de- a former defensive player of the year winner. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have defense off the bench. Again, Furcon's playing better and – Maybe maybe he heard those rumors and maybe he's like, okay, I need to step up. <laughs> um, True. But no, I, I, you, you said it too. JJ is having a down year. Is it partially because of what's going on with that team out there? Probably. Uh, is it partially because of him getting a year, another year older? Probably as well. But here's the thing: we talk about Tobias Harris reunion. Um, can can I uh, reunion with Doc Rivers for JJ help him out as well? So uh, I'm interested to see how that affects him and everything. Uh, but again. I uh I can uh I would not be opposed to a JJ reunion and I'm all for it if it's the right price. And here's the thing, the other two teams involved with it, Nets, Celtics and Sixers. So I'm honestly willing to consider getting him just so you keep him away from those keep teams. Away from the Nets and that's Celtics, the last thing yeah. I want the playoff series where JJ Reddick hits three threes against us and sends yeah. us home or something. So in that case, give up two seconds to keep him away from the Nets. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the I mean, the Sixers, though, in hindsight, like Miss was kind of saying on uh, his show, Mike Missanelli, you, if you give up a first for J.J., if you're first in the East, you're not really giving up a first because your first-round pick is pretty much a second-round pick at that point because you're in the back of the first round. Yeah. So you have to think of it in that perspective, too. If you just, It's kind of like for my hockey fans as well. Tampa gave up a first round pick for Barkley Goodrow. Barkley Goodrow is kind of like if you gave up, if you needed more shooting and someone gave out, out a first round pick for Trey Burke because they wanted more scoring off their bench and that's all they needed and it actually worked out. Like that's kind of what the equivalency would be there. They needed physicality. That's why they did that, where if you need shooting, you would get a guy like Burke. Uh, like that, that's sometimes when you need a guy that's, that's it showing out extra works because it doesn't hurt you in the long run anyway because your pick is going to be booty in the bottom of the round anyway so i mean you're not you're not gonna need the pick so that that's kind of just the way it is but i would say if they gave up a late first for jj i'm fine with it if he because i feel like if he comes back here what you said in that doc rivers has done the best with jj reddick doc rivers puts everybody in the best spot for themselves you see the pick and rolls run even more and he'll find ways to get J.J. back to, I think, at least a mid to high 30s, uh, three-point percentage. I'm not sure if at this point of the year you're going to see him at like 48%. But, I mean, that would be great, but I just don't see that being realistic. Um, so, like, you would you would be able to get him to the high 30s and do well, maybe even 40, and uh, do be one of the better guys again. Because you got Joel, the chemistry he had with Joel back. Dwight's good at kicking it back out and drawing defenders still at this point of his career even. When Ben actually gets his head out of his rear end and actually posts up down low, he draws defenders down low and has a good hook shot, which is why it pisses me off so much he doesn't use it. Um, So then you can kick it out there. Um, So you have all these guys that can kick it out. But before we go into predicting tonight's game, that's the last thing we're end on. Um, Ben Simmons and the fact that He's doing all right, 
still pisses me off, but he's doing all right. It's just, again, when you're doing something, keep doing it. Don't shoot two hook shots that look beautiful and then never go back down low again for the rest of the game. That's just what pisses me off. It's not like you don't do anything that makes me swarm and fuzzy inside because you do. It's just do it more often. Like when you're making those hook shots down low, keep making them. Like, you're so big, you're so good at throwing, you, you use your offhand. hand. He made a couple right-handed, and he just goes away from it. And I'm like, dude, you could dominate this league without shooting if all you do is drive and do that. You could probably average 20 even if you decide still to not shoot. Like, that's why that would appease the fans, too, if he averaged a bunch and just started dominating as a guard down low because he has the size to do it. That's why, for me... I was even thinking of making a video about it. I don't think Ben deserves to be top 10 in voting. I think Toby deserves to be top 10 in voting. I don't think Ben Simmons deserves to be top 10 in all-star voting. I think that's just by name. But what are your thoughts on Simmons? Uh, real quick, I disagree with that because Ben Simmons isn't well-liked around the league. Uh, I mean, you're going no, Twitter. Not by, no, 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 not by going... likeness. Not by likeness, just by brand name because LeBron likes him. And if, if LeBron likes somebody, you're probably going to get votes. That's more what I meant. We'll see. But, um... No, I hear you. I'm the same way. Um, Simmons, I, I think – here's the thing. I, I think the trade rumors with Harden and all that were affecting him because I think the moment after James Harden got traded, I think you've seen a different Ben Simmons the last five games. I really do. Um, you, you have 16 points, 15 points, 21 points, 17 points, all since the trade happened. Uh, and I think I think since then you've we've gotten the more aggressive Ben Simmons uh, we wanted. I mean we've texted back and forth game after game uh, on where we're like yes we need again I, I will continue to say it. Ben Simmons not shooting threes I could care less about that. You have plenty of other three, yeah. you have plenty plenty of other three point shooters on this roster that are, can continue to shoot well. All you need from Ben Simmons is find a way to get you that. Right now, before 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 James Harden trade, he was averaging about twelve point three points. That's not enough. You you can't only average twelve points if you're Ben Simmons. What he's no. been doing these last few games is what you need. I think if you get sixteen to twenty points from Ben Simmons, you're gonna win the majority of your games. You're gonna that that's where you need that's the range you need him in is that sixteen to twenty range. Again, I could care less if he does it. By shooting three threes, I could care less if he does it by shooting zero threes. But he's got to find a way, whether it's at the foul line or just field goals, he needs to hit that 16 to 20 point range. Obviously, we'll always take more points. But hit that 16 to 20 point range on a consistent basis, and you're going to continue to be the best team in the East. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. However, he does have to keep staying this aggressive, and I'm not trying to get fooled. It's like kind of the uh, Kendrick Lamar song. Fool me one time, shame on you. Fool me three times. I won't say the rest because we're getting in trouble with the uh, FD, uh, with the uh, cursing. But the uh, um, but anyway, you don't want to get fooled the third time. Let's just put it that way. And I this would be the third time I'm fooled by Ben Simmons showing aggressiveness for four to five games, and then going back into his little turtle show again. So. I need to see what happens going forward, how he looks against Sacramento tonight, how he looks going forward for the next five games. And then maybe when we do the next podcast, I'll say, okay, now I'm more confident Ben Simmons will stay. I, let's put it this way. I hope I'll be saying. Hello, you back? You froze. Yeah, you back. I was still talking. You froze on my end. Um, but anyway, he's back. Um, as we get into that game now with the Sacramento Kings, twelve and eleven Kings, seventh in their Western Conference, um, just in the postseason against the seventeen and actually wait no, J- there's the expanded postseason this year, right? There is the expand. So the yeah. uh, so there are a few I've spots seen- in the postseason. Top six make it, and then it's um, seven through ten do the playing game. Okay, yeah. So they're in the playing game right now, Sacramento. Um, and then the Sixers, 17 and seven, first in the East. 
Uh, if you're a betting person, the money line is minus 210 for the Sixers, plus 175 for the King, 231 total and a minus five spread to the Sixers, a plus five to the Kings, both at a one, minus 110, as well as the totals that are at a minus 110. Um, Andrew, what are you thinking of for this game and the direction it's going to go? And if you believe the Sixers are going to pull it out in Sacramento, why? What are your keys to tonight's game? Uh, first off, I, I think – People are going to look at this and remember the Kings the last couple of years, but here's my standpoint. Do not take this Kings team lightly. I honestly love watching this Kings team. They got a lot of fun guys on this team. They got a lot of young guys yeah. that are growing awesome. to be fantastic players. They're coming in, winning four straight. Don't take this team lightly. Do I think the Sixers are going to find a way to pull out a win? Yes. Do I think I could see them losing this game? Also, yes. I would not be surprised if the Kings find a way to pull this out. I'm going to pick the Sixers because obviously I do think we're deeper, we're better. We have an MVP candidate on our team. So when it's all said and done, I don't think anyone's going to be able to guard Embiid. So Embiid's going to drop 30, 30, 35. Yeah, they don't have anybody down there. It's Whiteside. Uh, Whiteside's their guy. (laughs) Yeah, you got Whiteside and Rashawn Holmes. So um, I I think uh, you're looking at two centers that Embiid's done fairly well against usually. And I, I expect this to be a win. I think uh, my keys to the game would be, uh, I, again, I think it's going to come down to Simmons. I think he's got to stay aggressive. I, I think you got to continue to do what you've done for the last five games. You can't afford anything. I, mean, or, I can't afford to go back, uh, as you said, into his shell. Uh, I think it's important for him to stay out there. Um, I, I'd say for this team, can get back to controlling, controlling the game. I feel like they've kind of lost that a little bit in terms of, uh, rushingness in terms of turnovers, in terms of not gathering themselves. I mean, you look at the Lakers game a few weeks, a uh, week ago, a few weeks ago, you kind of dominated that whole game and you kind of just lost rhythm at the end. That's why you allowed them to come back. You look at the Pacers True. game, you kind of took plays off here and there and didn't, and uh, we're, we're pretty hesitant, is what I'm trying to say. And then again, I think that's what you got to do today is play a full uh, 48 minutes and, uh, just don't be afraid. Just keep attacking, and, and, and the shots will continue to come. I mean, they'll find the open looks uh, at some point. Yeah, no, that's entirely true. Yeah, we did bring the Lake Show back into the game. A guy that's impressed me on the Kings, too, when I've been watching some games is uh, Halliburton, Tyrese Halliburton. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been shooting really well. He's been playing pretty good de- – not pretty good defense. He's been playing good defense. Um and uh, he's just impressed overall as an undrafted guy, I believe, from Iowa State. I don't think he was drafted. Was Hal Burton drafted? i not. Um, Give me a second. Yeah, I don't believe he was drafted. Um, and then they also just have – the funny thing about the Kings is, obviously they have Buddy Yield, one of my favorite shooters in the league that's still going a little bit this year, but I've always liked Buddy. Uh, so they do have him on their team. Uh, but – they have, I'm pretty sure Hal Burnham was undrafted, but they have the biggest nah, kids. He was first round, pick 12. Oh, he was first round? Oh, okay. In the 2020 draft. Oh, shit, okay. Tyrese Hal On here, it says no draft year. On If you look on score, it says no draft year. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah, he's a rookie. He was pretty good in college, right? He was at Iowa Where, State. like, if you click on De'Aaron Fox, it says first round, fifth by King. Where Halliburton just says no draft year. So usually that means you're undrafted. That's why I thought he was undrafted. Well, according to NBA.com, when you click on him, it says okay, draft Okay, he probably 20. was drafted. It's probably just score being stupid. Uh, but either way, he's uh, looked really good. And Marvin Bagley's looked good. They do have a good young up-and-coming team. It's just down low. You don't have the guys to guard people like the Embiid's, the Jokic's of the world. the uh, Even Jokic when he's healthy. Uh like got different guys down low that can kind of rebound and grab it from you. White side's not even been as good as he normally was back when the heat were winning uh, in the past couple years. He's kind of been a shell of the old white side. So, I mean, I would say Embiid should be able to take advantage down low. Rashawn Holmes is way too small to go to Joe Embiid. Um, no offense to him. He just is. Uh, and then white side, ain't good enough to guard Joe Albeed. It's been proven time and time again. So I would say because of that, they're going to be able to beat the King as long as De'Aaron Fox doesn't drop 50 and you're able to guard him and you don't leave Buddy Yield wide open. Well, you'll probably have Sims on Fox. He's not dropping. Yeah, so I think Fox should be fine. You should have um, – if, if, if um, That's Yield the guy starts, on the Sixers trade. Yeah. I go all in for Buddy Yield. 
yeah, we're the Aaron Fox, but they're not trading the Aaron Fox. Um, if they trade us the Aaron Fox, I would actually fly to Sacramento and hug whoever their GM is, and then just immediately leave Sacramento. Um, the, the right after that uh, exchange, it's like, wait, you're getting right well, back on the plane? Yes, I am. Yeah, I just stay out there for the game tonight. <laughs> yeah, um, it's like, yeah, I just had to come for that. It's like, oh, okay. But the Kings, you're right. You can't underestimate them. They're on a four game win streak. They're seven and three in their last ten. Uh, they're one of the hottest teams in the NBA. That's why they got back to the seventh spot and are looking right at the sixth spot being actually in the playoffs if they're able to beat us and continue the run rather than this new play-in format. So you definitely cannot overlook the Kings. They also have a guy on the roster that most people forget about that hasn't even played yet that's just sitting there to be used potentially as a secret weapon if they want to put him in at a certain time in Jabari Parker. Jabari Parker's just sitting on his rear end doing nothing, collecting paychecks. Uh, while the Kings are waiting to see if he can actually play at a certain point. He's not listed as injured anymore. He just is inactive. So it's going to be interesting if kind of like um, Monk, Malik Monk had this year, who didn't play at the beginning, and then they moved him into the rotation. If that's what happens with Parker, then all of a sudden you're like, wait, where'd this guy come from? <laughs> like, so like th- th- that, they do have a guy that could end up being a secret weapon as guy too in their system. And they also have a guy that's named Guy. <laughs> oh, he's... He's a fun guy. <laughs> yeah, they have. They I have, didn't play. He doesn't play much, but he, he was fun to watch in college. He was. He was. A, he was a good player for Virginia. Yeah, Kyle. Yeah, Kyle guy. Yeah. Um, but that's about enough puns and enough for us today. Um, well, real quick, the one, the one to watch out for too is he's a veteran that can do something at times, and that's Harrison Barnes. He's he's a guy that uh, he's always a, a very good player. He'll put in the work and and do things. True. And, if you don't guard him right, he can hurt you. I mean, it's kind of, it's weird. I wouldn't find him on our team either as a good, uh, bottom yeah, down low guy to have his depth. Yeah, that can play forward or can play uh, the three if you want him to a little bit too. Hey, his last five four. games, it's kind of crazy. 21 points, 24 points, 24 points, 28 points. And I don't know what happened this day, but four points. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everyone has their days. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you got to go with the Kings really well. This game is at 10 for people that don't know Eastern due to the fact that it's in Sacramento. Um, and uh, we wish our Sixers good luck. But I think both of us feel they're going to have a good win tonight and pull out a win as long as Joel keeps doing his thing, Ben stays aggressive, and our shooters keep their uh, consistencies up. We think they're coming out with the win. Andrew, did you have any more closing points before I give our Twitter handles and send us off here? Yeah, I love giving scores, so I'll give you a score for tonight. I'm going to go 113 to 109 Sixers. 113 to 109 Sixers. Okay, I'll go 115 to 110. I'll do it a five-point spread. We're right around the same (laughs) thing. Um, But 115, 110 Sixers. This has been the Sports Drag News Sixers podcast. We thank Andrew. Follow him at AJ underscore Santangelo. Check out his Pub Sports Radio baseball podcast with Jose there and all the other great stuff he does for Pub Sports and et cetera. And also, um, please check out SteelFlyers.com. Like, comment, and subscribe here. We really appreciate the support. I'm Joe Boric. Peace out, everybody.